Let's just pray. You ready to receive a word from God? Amen. Are you sure? Yes. I don't have any jokes today. So, <laughs> well, you never know. Hey, Jesus, please give me a joke. But um, let's receive. Jesus, we thank you that you are front and center of everything we do. And so, God, I thank you that even though we prepare words and we, and we give our time and we've set aside time to be here today, God, I thank you that not one person would have come in vain today. God, and I thank you, you know the needs of every single person here today. And so, God, I thank you that we would not leave empty-handed. So, Father, we just open our hearts, we open our hands, we open our minds, and we say, Jesus, speak to us. Holy Spirit, minister to us. Father, that every person would leave knowing that they have had a face-to-face -face with you, God. Not just a moment, but God, something that would change our lives. Something that would, would carry through into our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, into our, our workplace, into our family, into our hard places, into our secret places. God, the deep calls unto deep, Father God, and, and you know how to get there. And so God, we just say, have your way. Have your way, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. So we on... Um, on our uh, on a little bit of a series and a little bit of a, a teaching thing just to sort of shape where we are because God's doing stuff and and as he do, does things this is probably a few words that we will come back to visit every now and then and 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 often because people are being joined to us and so for us to continue what God has already done in our hearts and what we're still learning because you know as you go along the journey things become more clear and things become more defined and stuff and so as we're still learning it we'll keep coming back to a few values and a few principles of who we are as a church and so last week we started off with one of our values is the word of God because without the word of God and without us understanding the word of God it's almost like what difference does everything else make and so um we did a whole teaching on the Word of God, and, and this week we're talking about community. One of our values as a church is community. And you can use the word community, you can use the word relationships, you can use the word fellowship, you can use the word friendship, you can use any of those words because all it means is people coming together, people doing life together. And so I'm going to take some time to try and explain it to you, try and um, unpack it a little bit so that we can all so we can all understand. And it's not a thing where I'm telling you this is this is just me, this is who we are as a church. And this is what I believe God has put in my heart because, you know, when you sit down and you write values, you can just Google a bunch of values and teach on them. But if God hasn't made that personal to this church because we all are different with one body, the, the, the church of God, the bride of Christ, yet we've all got different functions and different strengths. And so if this is not an easy... Um, Oh, let me just pick five things that sound nice that I want to teach on. It's a God, what do we need to know as a church? And so relationships. And I remember four years ago when we were praying and, you know, you think back to when the church started and what were the words that were spoken over the church and all these things. And there were a few things that I remember actually coming back to because you can do church for so long and, and just sort of go with the motions and get caught up with the do's and the don'ts and rosters. I mean, rosters, we've had a fun time with rosters. And um, we don't have them anymore because we are the church and we all should be serving to see God's kingdom extended. And so if, you're not, if you don't want to be here, we don't want you to be here. <laughs> you know, when you're serving because you create, you create a vibe and the vibe that we're going for is unity and wanting to be here and stuff. So if we have to force you, rather wait until you're ready. And our heart is that you would actually feel so left out because we're having the best time and Krispy Kreme donuts for breakfast because who else does that? Uh, I needed coffee this morning, that's why we went there, and that's why you got Krispy Kreme donuts. And, um, and so that you actually go, you know what, God's doing something and I want to be part of that. That's our heart. Never to force anybody to do anything, although there might be conversations where I go, okay, it's time. You've got to get up and you've got to move because that's one of our values is servanthood. But we'll get there before I get ahead of myself. And so I remember... Right in the beginning, stopping, and when when we st I stepped into a place of leadership, and I'd been on around Adele and Fiona and the church, and we've been going for 12 years. How long has the church been going for? Since 2005, and uh, yeah, we anyway, did the maths, and um, and I remember. You know, conversations change and, and we start walking a certain way and we start relating to each other a certain way just because that's what happens in life, right? And I remember we'd be in prayer meetings and we'd go like, we need to just be happy with what we've got. 
And we just need, if this is God, all, wants, all God wants for us is to be a, a small church praying for the nation, then so be it. Yes, so be it. But the problem with that is we start putting our experience above what God's idea is for his bride, for his church. He wants a church that impacts a nation, a city, a neighborhood, your, your school friends, your work colleagues. That's what he wants. And so if we reduce it to just, we're just a personal little church that just prays because prayer is powerful. It is. You've, you've, you've tapped into one truth and forgotten about the big picture. And so I remember like going back and going, God, what was the word over us as a church? What was the word? Are we just called to be the small church? Now let me just clarify. Whatever God wants for us is what God wants for us. But it's never taking away from what his purpose is in the kingdom. So if our lives are not impacting others and actually making a difference and actually extending his kingdom, then we need to know we've only got half a truth. So prayer is powerful and we will always, always pray. And when we come together and we pray and we stand in agreement with people and we really put our faith in them, we fast, that is something we will do as a church. But if it's not extending the kingdom of God and we're not actually appropriating everything else he wants for us, we're not doing and fulfilling the call of his, of his church and standing up to attention on what the church needs to be doing. So there's so many different facets that fit together to extend his kingdom. So I remember thinking, we, we can so easily take that and then use it as an excuse as to why we're not growing or as to why it's not working or as to why it's comfortable just staying here. And the thing is, we've all stepped into it because it all makes sense. You're like, well, we're trying. And then you stay in a place where it's just small. And God doesn't want us to live small. I mean, even in the last few weeks, we've been looking. It's wide, expansive, open places. He's designed this life for us. He goes, you need to want to experience it. And you need to have an expectation to step into it. And so that was one of the things. I was like, okay, God, so we're not actually called to be a tiny church. We are called to be a church that makes a difference in the places that you put us. So whatever that looks like is fine with us. But if we limit him before we even extend ourselves, that's upside down. And the other thing is, I remember when we were prayed out um, of our big church, for those of you who don't know, we've got a church covering. We're just a church plant. And so although you may, may be able to count five or six on your fingers, we have got a massive backing of people who love us and pray for us and oversight. We're not just a little island. And um, I remember speaking to uh, Fiona and Simon at the time and sort of going, okay, where are we? What are we doing? I'm like, God, I don't really know what to do. I've been doing this for eight years. Like, what now? And I remember thinking back to the words and the prophecies and things that have been spoken over us as a church. And there was a conference called Face to Face conference in South Africa and they prayed out the first lot of people to come over and plant the church. And I remember somebody prayed that God would give you the keys. He would give you the keys. And I think it was might have even been Susanna, um, a, a very beautiful German lady, so quiet but powerful lady, and she said, God would give you keys, and, and I remember thinking, God, have you ever given us these keys? Like, what are the keys? What are the keys? And, and, you know, I was sitting down, and I felt so strongly in the first few weeks or months of actually praying for this church, going, God, what is it? What is one of our keys? And the thing that I felt so strong resounding in my heart was relationships, relationships, relationships. And... Um, we preached it, we, we studied it, and, and, and I shared it with the church back then. And it's something that actually hasn't ever left my heart. And it's not just because I like people and I can, and, you know, I can, you know, invite you over to my house. It's not. It actually is a key in this, king, in this, in this country. Because when you look at the, the, the sort of the British and the, um, the, the way people live over here, it's a pub culture. So people go out and meet in a common place. It's not very often. Pete doesn't count right now because he's much, very much South African and, I mean, he knows more South African naughty words than I do. So, you know, and, and pup and borscht and stuff like that. But the reality of it is, in this country, I remember the first time when I was working at a, a, com a company called Air Charter Service and it was my first sort of real experience where I could build relationship with British people on their terms, not my terms. I realized how different it is. Where it's, you, you don't just get invited into somebody's home. It's a very personal thing. What's that saying? We were talking about it. A king in your own home, or what's that one? Like, it's that separation. Thing. Come on. What's that saying, Johnny? Who was it? It was one of you guys I was talking to. Dirty rascal. Dirty rascal. <laughs> Not that one. But there's something about your kingdom, like your your your... 
your palace is your kingdom or something like that. What's that saying? Do you anyone know? Come on. Anyway, so we'll find it. But the reality of it is I remember inviting somebody to dinner because for me that's easy. Sometimes it's not easy for anybody else, but for me that's easy. I'm like, I can make you roast chicken. Roast chicken, if you come to my house, you probably have roast chicken. You do because we live on roast because I don't have time to stir. And so it's... um. So I remember inviting them, and they looked at me and went, in your house? I was like, yeah, where else? And they're like, okay. And they walked in, and it was like, we're in your house, and we don't really know you, you know? I was like, yeah, well, we're going to get to know each other, because I think I should have been half Italian, not half Afrikaans. Although Afrikaans people feed as well. But it's the thing of, we do life around the dinner table. In my home, you, people who know me, we eat, and we do life. And we chat, not with your mouth full. And you chat and you talk. <laughs> yeah, it's not nice sitting across the table and somebody's talking to you and all you can see is their food going around their mouth. It's gross. Um, so if you have somebody, like, just position yourself next to them next time so you can't see. But anyway, that's a tip for free. That's why you came today. And so I remember thinking, this is key for us in this nation because the kingdom of God is God's family. It's his church. It's about family. It's about community. And so if we're going to be building and extending his family, we actually need to live lives big enough so people can step into it, which means relationally. They need to be able to come alongside, find their place, fit into it. Now, we all have different strengths and stuff, so you're going to have people that are actually drawn to you, so don't fob them off. Because somebody's going to be able to relate to Joel on a much clearer personal level than they are, they are with me, ever. And so you've got to realize that you actually have a very, very important role to play. And when you're off, we're all off because we are the body of Christ. And so there's, I'm going to share um, a few scriptures and I'm going to be jumping around a few things and hopefully you'll get the heart of, of what I'm saying and, um, and then hopefully we'll be able to all get this and understand the part we play. And so I want us to first look at Luke 5, 18 to 25 in the Amplified. And it says, Behold, some men were bringing on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed, and they tried to carry him in and lay him before Jesus. Sorry. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him with his stretcher through the tiles into the, into the midst in front of Jesus. And when he saw their confidence in him springing from their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. So here we have an account where there's a guy who is paralyzed. There is no way for him to actually step physically to get close to Jesus. Because back in those days, Jesus was a, a human being. He is where he was. And, you know, if you wanted to see him, you, you went to him. And so in this day, this guy is paralyzed. There is no way that guy could get there. Now, if we just broke it down for a little, a, little while, a little bit, you know, just work with me. We live in a nation where people might be moving and talking and going to and fro, catching tubes and trains. But in their hearts and in their minds, they have no idea how to get from a place of death, being paralyzed, being consumed with fear, feeling an, like an outcast, feeling like nothing makes sense, to actually going, you talk about this freedom, but I have no idea how to get there. You talk about this healing, but I haven't seen it in my life yet, so I don't actually know. I've been to every single doctor. Because in life, we actually see things for what they are. And sometimes we forget about what they could be in Christ. And so, so we live these literal lives, very literal, while well, I can't get there. And I've never been invited. Or I wasn't included. And so we just sort of excuse ourselves, like this paralyzed man, I can't get to Jesus. But thank goodness for the group of men that he was around, because they, in their hearts, go, went... Well, we could get there. We actually know the way. And there's enough of us to come around you, to pick you up and take you on a journey that might be hard, that might be uncomfortable, that might actually see a few um, obstacles and you know challenges along the way, but we're not just going to leave you and go, it was too hard. They didn't leave him going, can't get through. So they try once, nobody comes to church. Second time, try once, hey, do you want to come over? No. Try another conversation. Hey, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Those things are what's happening. There is a state of paralyzation in this country. If you're not in God, you are dead. 
That's the end of the world. Uh, not the end of the world. That's the end of the, the, the matter for you. Speaking to, Dead, to Noah this, this week, and he was talking about Muslims, they, they're learning about Islam at school, and which is fine to understand what different religions are. There's nothing wrong with knowing a different religion and knowing the differences so that people could know truth from lies and deceptions and all those sort of things. There's nothing wrong with it. And so we're having these conversations. But to just sort of go, you fit in that box, it's never going to get better or it's a little bit hard for me to get you to that place, you give up before you've even started. And these guys did not. First of all, they had to pick him up. It took strength. It took commitment. And it took a few people doing it together to get one person closer to Jesus. And that's what it was. When it got hard, when their hands started slipping, when the guy started cramping, and, well, I don't know if you could cramp, he was paralyzed, but either way, you know, go with me. And... Uh, they, they got to the, and then they looked at the situation going, well, you know what, we've done what we can. And how many of us give up at that point? Mm. I, read, so, I read something recently where it goes, when you feel the urge to quit, you've got to know that your breakthrough is just around the corner. Because that's when the enemy just keeps going and he keeps going and he keeps going and you get so tired. And that's when you give up and that's when he takes you out. And it's right around the corner. And so I was thinking about this when these, this morning, actually. This was not a scripture that I prepared, but when I was praying, I was like, this is it. So I'm going with it. This is the sort of relationships that we need to have. This is what the church is called to do, to be those people who will go the distance to get some person, one person, as close to Jesus as they possibly can. Not because they walked past him and said, you need to get to church and carried on walking. Not because they came along and said, repent, or, you know, turn or burn, or whatever those messages are, or, well, I've got the answer, my church is great, but you've never actually said, can I come and fetch you? Because sometimes just this, the sheer thought of taking that step or actually pitching up is so nerve-wracking. What if somebody doesn't notice me? What if somebody doesn't speak to me? What if I'm the, like, I know nothing about the Bible? Who cares? You're there. And we need to be those people committed to go the distance. And it's not going to take one person. It's going to take a group of people who carry the burden, who lift the load, who go the distance, even when it's hard, even when we see obstacles, to actually say, God, this is one person's life, that if I can get him close to you, you can do the rest. He can find his healing in you. You can make him realize that there's a community of people who believe in him, who believe in you so much that they wouldn't give up on him. And so when things get a little bit hard, it's not the time to go, well, well, I wish you could get there. It's the time for you to roll up your sleeves as a body, as a group of people, and actually go, I can be a solution to this problem. I can be a solution to this problem. And so let's read together in Ephesians 6. I read it on, on Thursday. It's a scripture I've been meditating on for months. And I just want to read it to us. It says, My beloved friends, if you see a believer who is overtaken with fault and has fallen from the place of victory, this is the reality. We've just looked at the paralyzed man. He was not in relationship with God. He was not in community with him. He was separate. He was paralyzed. He was, you know, for the, in all intents and purposes, the point that I'm trying to make, he wasn't in that place of close relationship. But now Ephesians is telling us, if you see a believer, so that means relationship is important for people on the outside, as much as it's important for people on the inside. And it says, every belie if you see a believer who is overtaken with a fault and has fallen from a place of victory, before we run away and go, oh, so-and-so got caught up in this and that and these big sins, because you know, a human, we separate sins and we sort of label them. This is a big sin, this is a little sin. I love how it says it, fallen from a place of victory, which means you're not where you should be. Now, whether it is a massive sin, the way the world would class sin and, and have a stick, like a, a label put on you or whatever, or whether it is you've just actually fallen out of sync in your heart with trusting God. It's all the same. You're not walking in a place of victory with God. It says, May the one who overflows with the Spirit seek to restore him to fellowship with the Anointed One. It's the same principle. It's not to come alongside and say, I'm your hero. Praise the Lord that you know me. God is so good, he put me in your life. You know, we can joke about those things. The whole heart of it was to restore him to fellowship with the anointed one. Everything we do as a church is to bring people who are far from God as close as possible to him and say, now 
God, he's here with you. It's you and Jesus. This is as close as we can get you there. That's our call. That's our purpose. That's what we are doing as a church. And it's all going to come out of relationship. If you're not in relationship and if you're not in fellowship, how are people going to come around you and go, you know what, you've fallen from a place of victory? The other thing is, this is a safe place. As much as we are humans and we might be proud, prideful, if that's even the right word, or we might you know, be battling with things in our hearts, this is what it's supposed to look like. So if somebody comes alongside and goes, hey, are you okay? Hey, I've noticed you've become a bit negative. Hey, I've noticed you've not been yourself. Can I pray with you? Let's not be like, oh my gosh, I wish you would just leave me alone. It's like, this is a safe place because if you're on a slow decline, God puts people around you not to go, I've got all the answers, but to say, hey, 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 can I pray for you to get back to that place? where you and God are like this. That's our heart as a church, not to draw people unto ourselves, but to actually restore them back into fellowship with the Anointed One. Win him over with gentle words, which will open his heart to you and will keep you from exalting yourself over him. Love empowers us to fulfill the law of the Anointed One as we carry each other's troubles. It's the same sort of picture, carrying somebody's trouble as the people on the outside, as much as we need it on the inside. So don't be so externally focused that you forget about the person sitting next to you today. Don't be so focused on the person sitting next to you where you're only trying to keep everyone okay in this sort of room that you forget about the people on the outside. It's actually having that openness to be able to go, I'm walking with you, I'm doing this journey with you. And I was listening to some, th some teaching things in the last few weeks and I was reminded of it as well, is where, you know, these people, and I'm not bashing it, hear what I'm saying, where, you know, on the street corners, we've got somebody that lives in our, ha in our street, actually, and he's got a massive postcard, and it says, the end of the world is near. Have you seen him? And he walks up and down Grand Drive, and he's like, repent, the end of the world is near. And he just walks with this massive placard, and he, and he, he I, don't, I don't know if, you know, where he lives or anything, I know he's in our road, but that's all I know. And, or, and he changes it, or peace to the world, or God save the world, and he changes his massive post all the time. Or, you know, you see these, these in the old, olden days, or maybe even today, you still have people standing on a street corner who are preaching the gospel, going, if you do not repent today, this and that and the next thing's going to happen. Now, there is a place for that. And if God has called somebody to do that sort of street evangelism, shouting, you know, like declarations over a nation or whatever, there is a time and a place for that. And sometimes we go, Flip, that's so bold. That is so bold. I don't have the courage to actually stand on a step ladder and just preach and tell people they need to repent. Otherwise, you know, eternity is sealed for them and it's not where they want to be. And, and sometimes you stand and you think, that is, that is hard and please don't, God, don't ask me to do that, hey? Has anyone been there? Has anyone actually walked past them and gone, oh, Jesus? <laughs> hey? Anyone done that? And so I'm not bashing it at all. I'm not. But what I'm saying and what I was reminded of when I was listening to this teaching is that sometimes we think that's bold. Sometimes we think Bronwyn going across the nations is bold. But you know what's more bold? Is what, hear what I'm saying, Bronwyn, I'm going to fix that right now. <laughs> is that Bron's not just going on, they're going, here you go, guys, we've raised money for you, there, I'm out of here. What's more bold and what takes more time and what takes more effort is actually when you take the time to build a relationship with somebody, where you get to know them. Because on the side of the street, you can look at somebody and go, you look upset, and then you start labeling them, oh, you must be in a broken relationship, oh, you must be blah, 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 and we start just racking up things against them because why? We are judgmental people. It's just the way we are, right? God can refine us and all the rest. But sometimes we can just misinterpret a situation and speak death over it, judge them, and never actually have the time to get to know them and win the right to speak into their lives. That is key, to win the right. So when Bronwyn goes across borders, she's not just dropping a package in a safe place. Because the difference between somebody standing on the corner is you don't actually know those people. And when they go back home, you've got nothing to lose because nobody knows you. You haven't put your, like, your heart out there and your life out there and, and sort of 
lived life with them and gone through the trenches and gone through the highs and, and stuck with them and just being there, they sort of guy that just stays with them. If you've just shouted truth or whatever, threats, sometimes it's threats, you'll go to hell if you don't repent right now, which is true, but there's a way and there's a manner in which we do things. When Bronnie goes, she spends time with them. She lives alongside them. She goes into the same dangerous places that they go. She cries with them. She laughs with them. And she's not there to fix all their problems. And sometimes we think as relationships, as you step into that place, I've arrived. I have arrived and you are most favored of the Lord because you know me. And I can fix all your problems. And all it is is actually going, you know what? I know the one who can fix all your problems. And so I'm going to stick close. And I'm going to roll up my sleeves. And I'm going to pick you up on the stretcher. And I'm going to walk with you until we get as close to God as you possibly can. That takes guts. That takes effort. That takes boldness. Getting to know somebody, even when you don't like what they're going through, but because you've chosen. Because it's easy to turn your back and go, that's too hard for me to deal with. I've heard it in church circles as well where... I'm just being real now. It's not even on my notes. But it's like you do time with people in church and, and people are irritated with each other, but nobody's actually taking the time to go, you know, can we just meet for coffee? Because we've been so caught up on, on just doing life and we get irritated and it doesn't fit with us anymore. And, you know, and I've listened to so many teachings on fellowship and, and friendship and all these things recently. Friendship and relationships can get messy. They can. But if our goal and our sole purpose is to actually keep ourselves, each other, in the place of victory. We spoke about it last week. To stop fighting your own corner, start, start fighting somebody else's corner, which means you take your eyes off yourself a bit because somebody's going to fight for you if you're fighting for somebody else. And so let's get back to my notes. Hebrews 3.12 3, says, Be careful then. Next one, sorry, Dad. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still called today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. That is one of my favorite scriptures. In a different translation it says, Encourage one another daily. It is one of my mantras in life. Speak life. Encourage one another daily. While it's still called today, every single day people need encouragement. Every single day somebody needs to know, I'm with you. It's going to be okay. Even if you don't know if it's going to be okay. Every single day we have the opportunity to go, hey, what can I do for you? How's it going? Every single day. In Hebrews 2, if you go back to it, um, just one, it says, this is why we ought to pay even closer attention to the voice that has been speaking to us, that we will not drift away from it. Now, this is the thing in drifting. It doesn't happen like this. It happens subtly, and it happens without noticing. Have you ever gone to the beach? Have you ever gone to the beach? I'll just stop there. And you jump in, and your parents are sitting right there, and you sort of back up, and you've got your landmark, and you swim, and you go under two waves, and you come up, and they are nowhere to be seen. Actually, you've been, you know, sort of, what's the word? dunked and so you think you're drowning and nobody's watching you and all you're doing is got your you're like basically digging a hole in the sand on the shore and so you look up and you're like where have they gone and all it was two waves and you're not anywhere and you can't recognize anything drifting doesn't happen intentionally and this is what it's saying is that we need to be so aware that this happens even though you're in church even though you're pitching up we have to be aware that it's so easy to just sort of fade away. You know? This is what the commentaries say about the scripture. This letter is punctuated with passages that sound alarm and danger, both imminent and eternal, is at hand. The real danger is that a gentle erosion of, of rock-solid commitments. Isn't that powerful? The gentle erosion of rock-solid commitments. How often this happens? Every single one of us has probably been there. You start off, you're committed, you're hanging from you know, the rafters, you're like excited, you're shouting it from the rooftops, and then just slowly life happens. And that thing that was solid in you, that conviction, you started out strong, you're going to do this and see it till the end, starts being questioned and starts being you know, just changed by the invisible forces that shape the culture and the world. 
but we have to be careful. And that's what that scripture says, be careful. And why? We have to be careful because if we're not in that place where somebody's come alongside and going, hey, are you okay? Stay with it. Don't give up. Speak life. Keep that relationship going. Are you okay? How's it, how are you feeling? You know, all those things are really, 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 really important to us. It carries on in Hebrews 10 where it says, Since we have a great high priest who presides over the house of God, let us draw near with true hearts full of faith, with hearts rinsed clean, clean of every, <laughs> any evil conscience, and with bodies cleansed with pure water. Let us hold strong to the confession of our hope, never wavering since the one who promised to, it to us is faithful. Let us consider how to inspire each other to greater love and righteous deeds. If we live life like that, were you actually inspiring somebody to greater love? Don't allow offense. Have a conversation going, hey, hey, I'm going to stay with you. Don't allow this to take root in your heart. Hey, this slightly drifting, gentle erosion. Don't believe in this anymore. It's not working out for me anymore. Not forgetting to gather as a community as some have forgotten, but encouraging each other daily. We're talking about community. We're talking about gathering together. And the Bible warns us. It says, guys, do not be so careful. And it speaks about it in Hebrews 2 and 3. And it carries on until Hebrews 10. And then you read all those other scriptures that we've just looked at. And the Bible warns us. Why? Because he knew that as human beings, this is what would happen. If we go straight into the Garden of Eden, the first thing that happens in Adam and Eve, in absolute close relationship with God, something happens, and the first thing they do is they isolate themselves. They step out. They step away. They just hide. They just turn. Because something got between them and God. And so this is what happened. God goes, where have you gone? Why did you hold back because you made a mistake? He's not as scared of your mistakes. He's not overwhelmed by the thing, thoughts you think and the fears you feel. He's like, why are you pulling away from me? Because the only real answer and the only real victory is if you stay there with me, with your thoughts, with your fears, with your insecurities, that's where they're going to be overcome. Not when you step out because you're embarrassed that you're feeling things, thinking things, experiencing things. Another version says, do not neglect the meeting together. Why? Because when we're not meeting together, when we're not in community, how are people going to come around us going, I can encourage you daily. I can build you up. I can speak into that. I can come alongside you. I read something some t this week as well where it says in marriage, somebody gave really good advice. It's saying, because we all go through big uh, ups and downs in marriage, and it's real, and it's something you actually have to work at. And it says that the key to a successful marriage is that both of us don't fall out of love at the same time. Because it's not all, you know, roses and, and you know, honey and milk and steaks and whatever you want to call it. It's not. And the key to, to just longevity is that, you know, you may have a down day, but somebody else is still having a good day. And it, it actually makes sense, is that, you know, you work at it together. But while you're in community, here's the thing. Isolation. I was going to show a video this morning, but it was way too brutal for my own liking. I actually had to switch it off last night when I was looking at it. National Geographic. And when you start looking at to give an illustration, I'm not, I wasn't going to do it because some of us are sensitive to stuff like that. I, for one, am one. But let's talk about Predators. Predators of all sorts, predators in the wild, I actually had to start, I had to refine my search because predators are, there's a lot of stuff about sexual predators and kids and all that stuff which is quite intense for me. And um, But when you look at it, the behavior and patterns of predators always is isolation. Their main goal is to isolate. You can look at it in the wild and you can look at it in, in, in real life, where people are going after somebody is to get them separate. It's to actually get them away from the herd. And that's the enemy. He separates. He comes between and he starts pushing you away. And you can go and Google it. You can go and type in, you know, a, a cat, like cheetahs hunt, lions hunt, wild dogs hunt, all these sort of things. They will show you very real graphic illustrations of what's going on. And that's exactly what the enemy does. He comes in and he separates and he comes between and he goes, if I can get you away from it, then I can actually take you out. 
And when you look at the cheetahs and the lions and we think they are the big things and they're the ones that are going to actually, you know, take us out. And the enemy, the Bible says, he walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. And the thing about lions is that they can reach massive speeds, but they can't keep it up. So their hunts and their attacks are very quick. They wait, they watch, and then they go for it. They look, they see, they see vulnerability, they see isolation, they see something that is slightly out of whack, and they take you out. But did you know that wild dogs actually have a much higher success of killing than, animal, than lions? I didn't know this. I learned this last night. Because wild dogs have, like, um, work in packs, and they, they can actually run for much longer than a cheetah or a lion can. So they've got much more strength and much more stamina, but it only lasts for a short period of time. With dogs, they just chase. And they're small, right? And they just chase and they chase and they chase and they run and they run. And when they get tired, the, the rest of the pack take over. And the rest of the pack take over. And they're these tiny little things. They're smaller than hyenas and all these things. It's big ears and they look cute, but they're not. And people think they're the worst because they don't actually kill their, their prey. They just eat them while they're alive. Because what happens is they chase them until the guy is so exhausted that he actually just can't anymore. And that's when they all take part. They all come around and they all attack at the same time. And there's an, there's an alpha male and female and they eat last. And the moms that are feeding, this is just a bit of amazing facts for you. The moms that are feeding, looking after the cubs and wherever they are, or puppies, where they are, the other moms take food, eat enough for them and take it to them. They regurgitate. How's that, eh? And then when everything else, they make sure the puppies eat first. This is all information for you. They make sure the little ones eat first, and then they make sure the, 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 the women eat first, the ones that are nursing. And then lastly, the alpha male and female will eat. And if there's not, they carry on chasing so that everyone has their full. They hunt every single day. Whereas with the lions, the, the dominant one eats first and then goes the other way. And if the babies, there's nothing left for the babies, they die. How weird is that, eh? Didn't know that. So we have to value the intentionality of community. We have to value it for yourself personally and for the people you do life alongside. You have to be intentional about everything that we're doing. Because if the enemy can isolate you, he'll get you when you're weak. And he'll start getting into your mind and start thoughts that creep in and feelings that you start feeling and resentments and bitterness and offense. And he just starts separating you. And while you're weak, that's when he attacks. And when you're feeling down, that's when he jumps on you. And when you're exhausted, he'll get you. And so if you're not real and vulnerable, and that's the thing about community, it takes vulnerability. It takes honesty. It takes humility to say, you know what? I'm actually not where I should be. And before any one of us, this is a warning for us here as a group of people now and for when we grow because God is going to add people to us, never jump to conclusions. Because if, you know, somebody goes, I need to speak to you, you always think, I wonder what it could be. And it could just be, you know what, they're just battling because their mom isn't doing well or they haven't seen their mom and they're questioning God when they're going to see their mom. You know, it could be something that basic or it could be something really, really real. But if we judge and put up things before or feel that we're not qualified to speak to somebody, we miss the opportunity to actually come alongside them and say, okay, I'm here. I can t I'll be your ears, I'll come alongside, I'll pray. I don't have the answers, but I'll see what I can do. And so the enemy comes in and he creeps in or we get passive or we start thinking, believing lies that oh, nobody will understand. Or people will judge me. Or, What's the point anyway? And so you start you know, hiding those things. And the more you hide them and the more those fears you cover up and the more those feelings you cover up, the more the, the, that sort of distance grows bigger and stronger. And, and, you know, and God goes, no, no, no. You've got to come alongside so somebody can speak life into you, can encourage you and, and just keep you stronger. Because the enemy knows that we are stronger together. A predator knows that there is value in numbers. So when you're together and you are strong, and you are in the midst of, how can he get to you? When people are speaking life, when you are surrounded by words of truth and not lies, he knows if he can get you out of that place and isolate you, he'll get into your hearts, your thoughts, your emotions, your commitments, 
and he'll just start wreaking havoc before he takes you out. We have to be intentional. We have to make an effort to stay in community. It's a requirement for every single one of us. I can't make sure you stay in community. We have to make sure that we stay in community and in relationship. We have to stay connected. Pick up the phone. Phone somebody. Message them. Go for a drive. Drop off for dinner. Pray for somebody. Let them know you're praying for them because sometimes just the fact that somebody said, I'm praying for you, could be I'm not forgotten and God is speaking to somebody. Thank you, Jesus. There's a big difference be between doing life separate versus in a community. When you're in a team, when you're standing on the sidelines and when you're in a team playing a sport, you can see strengths being highlighted. Hey, you've got an opening, you're strong, you can make that play and you can score for the team. No, you're not. Let me cover you. Let me come behind you. Let me help you out with that move. You know, whatever sport you're good at. There is a, there is a dynamic when you're playing in a team where strengths complement strengths and weaknesses are covered that the ultimate goal and purpose is eventually reached. And that's how God designed it. He said it's not good for man to live alone. We were not created to do this Christian life alone. And so when people go, oh, you know, church, I've done church, and people are people, let me tell you now, people are people and they will disappoint you. They will hurt you because we're all people. And you will disappoint and let somebody else down. And that's okay because together we come alongside and go, okay, so that was an experience. Let's learn from it. Let's keep going. I'm not saying it's okay to be hurt. And I'm not giving you a reason that it's people and I just don't have to try anymore. That's not what I'm saying. Because if we're all working towards one goal, we will all be on the same page. We have to remember that it's a God design. It's not a good suggestion or a nice to have because I like friends and some people would prefer to sit at home and just stare at the ceiling because sometimes we do like to do that. You know, we joke about the boys and the nothing boxes and you've got a time and a place to go to your nothing box but you cannot isolate yourself. Nobody should isolate themselves. The word translated church in the English means an assembly of called. It implies that members have said yes to God. And we are, we are coming together because God himself said so. When we don't, when we forsake the gathering, when we don't see the coming together in midweek meetings and having conversations and prayer meetings and team meetings and we sort of go, oh, I don't need that. I don't have to be part of that. All we're doing is that we're actually stepping away from what God has purposed the church to do purposed community to do. We cut ourselves off from gifts, from encouragement, from the vitality of other people coming alongside us. And then what happens in reverse is that you actually deprive somebody else of what God has put in your life. It always works both ways. It's not just a receive, receive, receive. It's also not just a give, give, give. It's a transparency. It's a I need it and you need it. You need what I've got. I need what you've got. He talks about the church being the body of Christ. The body of Christ. Let's read it. I don't know where that scripture is. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding. It's in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25. For as a model for our understanding, our lives together as a church, every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. And sometimes we get caught up on the parts that are mentioned and we get resentful because of the parts that aren't mentioned. And God goes, it's normal, there's certain parts, but every single part is vital. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. And if one part flourishes, every other part enters into exuberance. You are the are Christ's body. That's who you are. And you must never forget this. Only as you accept your part in the body does your part mean anything. And don't be chasing somebody else's part because who will fulfill your part? See, the thing is, when you look at that scripture and you think about the body as such, if you were to cut off the finger, that finger would die. If you thought it was just a small, tiny part, it's not a vital organ, it's not one we talk about, 
or little toe. I've heard it say, if you lose a little toe, a big toe, your balance goes off. Which one is it? Your little toe? Little toe? And nobody really thinks about a little toe, but have you ever bashed it against the corner of something? Hey? Ripped it off almost, you know? It carries an important part and it makes a massive difference. So if you separated something from your body, that thing that has been separated will die and the rest of the body might not function as efficiently as it should be by functioning. Although we could carry on, there's something missing. There's something that's not there that should be there and functioning the way it should be functioning. We have to know this. It says you've got to remember this. Because we first belong to God. And if we belong to God, we belong to his body, his, his church, the body of Christ. So community and relationship is his idea. He himself came to earth. He could have just sent the word and healed all our diseases and said, I'm starting again and turn the page, blank page, brand new canvas. He could have done, done that. But he came in, moved into the neighborhood, did life with people. He ate with people. That's where I get it from. He ate with people. He spent time with them. He called a betrayer, my friend, Judas. He said, my friend, do what you need to do. My friend. And he knew what was in his heart. He walked with doubting Thomas going, I know you don't really believe, but let's try this again. Let's go through this again. Until you understand it, I'm not going to give up on you. And this is what he did. He modeled it to us. One of my new sort of sayings is, example it. Example it. Don't just tell somebody this is what you're doing and you should be doing. And you know, it's easy for me to go, these are our values and this is how we speak. And then you step into a situation and you go, that's not how we speak, this is how we speak. But you actually haven't said it in the right tone. You haven't actually got the heart of why we're doing it. And so just calling out phrases is not the same as actually going, I get it. I can example it. I can come alongside you and teach you in a very gentle way. Earn the right to speak into your life. Earn the right to go, hey, have you maybe thought about saying it this way? Just an example. There's so many examples I can use. See, the problem is in church is that sometimes we're all waiting for somebody to be our solution. And God's actually said we need to be the solution. We all have a part to play. So when we sit back and going, well, nobody's noticed me. And nobody has called me. And nobody has prayed for me. And nobody this. And nobody's picked me up on my stretcher. It works both ways. Are you doing it for somebody else? Because I tell you what, you need it in your life. We all need it in your life. I need prayer as much as you need prayer. I make mistakes sometimes, not as often as Johan. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. God knows what's in our hearts. So when you think, oh, I can do this alone, let me tell you, you can't. You cannot do this alone. And if you take a step back, you know, there's that, there's that old cartoon where it says, what happened to the, the banana that left the bunch? He got peeled. I couldn't find that picture either. Or when you take a coal out of the fire, it dies out. And there's all those things. And the reality of it is, I don't want to be that person, and you don't want to be that person, and I don't want you to be that person either. And so if you think you can do this alone because, you know what, I can't be bothered with people, that's a lie from the enemy. And so our goal as a church is relationships, relationships, relationships. Let it be the foundation of absolutely everything we do. Earning the right to do life with somebody. Not bail at the first sign of struggle. Not bail when somebody is battling with something that you don't actually have the answers for. And it's going to take time, and it's going to take effort, and it's going to take heartache and tears and joys and laughter. But when we get to the victory together, then at least you know you've done what God's required us to do. And there are so many different scriptures, but I'm not going to go into it. So going forward, let's never forget that people, every person, person, every person needs to and wants to belong Every single person has a design in their heart to be part of something. And how easy is that to just include somebody in your life? And even though you've been hurt in the past, don't stop. Don't stop. You know, it's been said, it's like if you've gone to a restaurant and you've had a bad meal, do you just stop going to restaurants? Stop eating out? Has anyone done that? Has everyone 
boycotted restaurants or restaurants for the rest of your life because you've had one bad meal. It's the same thing. You just get up, you forgive again, you try again. Order something else or just don't go back to that restaurant. But don't stop. Let's be a person that knows. Now we have a responsibility to steward people and give them opportunities to belong, to find their place, a safe place. Some language that we use in this church and some language that we will always use is that we are intentional. Everything we do, when you meet with people, make sure they know you've prepared for them because that makes a difference. Oh, I'll prepare for you. My heart was ready. I, I'm, I'm prepared for you. It's invitational. Every person needs to know they can come. It's invitational and it's inclusive. We're not an exclusive church. If somebody didn't get an invite, it doesn't mean they weren't invited. It just means... We didn't know. They are invited. Everyone is included. Safe place is another word. We need to create an opportunity for people to find belonging, to find relationships, to find community. And like I said, your strengths are not my strengths. So don't bow this one out. Because you're going to be able to speak to people, encourage them, admonish them, speak life over them, go the distance with them, because your battles aren't my battles. And there's something in the weight of somebody going, I've been there, I know what you're going through, versus, oh, I've heard about that, and these are the answers. Those are not the sort of answers we want, to just go, oh, I've read up about that, and try X, Y, and Z. It doesn't carry the same weight as when you go, I've connected, and I know what you're going through. So your, your journey, your journey is vital to this church. Your journey, your part, your experience. Old people, young people, grannies, grandpas, young grannies and grandfathers. Just want to clarify that. Um, great, great grannies, all of you. Your maturity, your distance, your things you've learned. We need them. There are people that are going to walk through the door. They're going to need somebody to go, let me just love you. Let me just come alongside you. Hey, you pitched up. Well done for coming. That's the sort of church. Relationships, relationships, relationships. And so in conclusion, let me just summarize those things. Relationships, 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 what God showed me was first and foremost is our relationship with him. That's, that's a, a must. But secondly is, oh, that's number one, our relationship with him. We've got to know who we are and understand it. Then we have to understand church and family. And then we have to understand community because it works like a ripple effect going out and works in reverse coming in. If we don't have a strong understanding of who we are in Christ and that that relationship is vital, how will it overflow into our families and the church family? How will we be able to do relationship, go the distance, say what we need to say, encourage one another daily if there's nothing to work with? And when we, excuse me, doing that strong, how can people miss it when they go, there's something about that group and I want to be part of it? How come they can do life like that? How come they can forgive? How come they can give? How come they're generous? What is it? And then, we're working backwards, when the, when the people step in here, they go, there's something about this church that I want to stay with. They do relationships strong. How come their marriages are strong? How come their friendships are like real and not just superficial, you know, it's like to smile, know what, how many sugars you take in your coffee and move right along? Something different. And why? Because... It is established in a relationship and identity with God. And so relationships, that's who we are. We go the extra mile. Don't give up on anybody. And if you feel like you've given up on somebody, I'm asking you to actually go back and say, God, I've given up, but give me the patience, give me the wisdom, the endurance, the words, the heart to actually say, I'm going to pick up your cross. I'm going to pick you up on that paralyzed mat and I'm going to get a bunch of people around me because I can't do it alone. And I'm going to carry you and get you as close to God as I possibly can. Because that's my commitment to the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that your word is so clear and you are a relational God. You created us to have intimate relationship with you. And then you surrounded us with people, Father God, to do church with, that you created your body and you call it the family of God. And so, God, for that we say thank you. Thank you, God. And so, God, today I just want to pray for every single person 
that is paralyzed. God, people in this room and people we are trusting you for, people who don't even know that there is a Savior that can bring healing in their lives, people who don't even know there is wholeness on offer, forgiveness on offer, God. And I thank you that today, Lord, those people in our midst and those people we are trusting you for, Father, you would give us the strength, the endurance, the stamina to come alongside and say we're praying for you. And we will pick you up when you don't even know how to carry on. When you don't know how to put one foot in front of the other, we will pick you up, God. I pray that you would show us and give us opportunities to create, to, or give us wisdom to create opportunities for people to actually find their community and their, their belonging in you, in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for every person in this body who might be feeling that they have just fallen from a place of victory, God, whether it be in our thoughts, in our attitudes, in our desires, in our outlook, God, whether it be something tangible or whether it be something, whatever it, God, if we're not where we should be, Father, I thank you that as a body of Christ, God, we would be praying for the people on our left and our right, people that aren't even here, God, that not one person would, would drift away. God, that not one person would drift too far away where they just lose sight of who you are, but, Father, we would come alongside with gentle words, with love, overflowing in the Spirit, God, not because of us, but God, because of you. Our sole purpose is to take something that is far and broken and separate from you and bring it as close to the Anointed One, to a place of victory. And so, God, I pray for those people in this church that need to know that there are people carrying their stretcher. Father, I pray that you would give, you would give them the strength to actually start creating community, God, that you would start giving us the wisdom to be open and vulnerable and making an effort to, to make sure we're part of community and relationship. And God, that the people on the receiving end, Father, that we would also know how to respond. God, just to do the walk, to commit to it. And God, I thank you that you would teach us, but Father, that we would stay in a place with victory with you, God, and people would be restored to a place of victory with you, Father God. And I just pray that over this church. In Jesus' name, I pray that if we need to forgive God, we would forgive. If we need to release God, we would release. God, if there are offenses that have just separated us from, from you and what we, we are about, God, that you would just show us and that we would be able to just give it back to you, God, and say, it's, it's yours, God. Let me start again. But God, I thank you that this church would be built on relationships, that this church would be built on going the distance. And our goal would be to get people as close to you as we possibly can. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.